Lieber from Seed Time and Harvest, and he's going to tell us a little bit about the ministry. Okay. Well, we've uh, been at this here for several years. We became organized just uh, a number, a few years ago, uh, as a 501c3. But I've been doing some radio work for uh, probably 15 years or so since the late 90s, and so that's uh, what kind of our strong point. Uh, short one-minute spots and so we send those out I send them out to about 25 places and uh, you know God is able to take a little and do a lot with it and so I'm guesstimating I don't know for sure I'm guesstimating that that turns into between 450 and 500 stations um, because we send them through life talk we send them through radio 74 and also 3ABN so um, that's, the, that's the, the strong point. We do a little bit of video work, um, but uh, not a lot. We have a website. It kind of went dormant for a while, and so we're starting to pick that back up. But just in the last several months, I've had some real challenges with equipment. My camera quit working. My printer quit working. I had some other programming. It didn't work very well. Sent the camera in. It did, came back. It still didn't work. So, but you uh, didn't quit working. But I didn't quit and working. And God didn't quit no. working, right? Kick, okay. kick down, but not kicked out. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. So you brought some slides with you. Would I did. you like to um, go through that and, and show us what you have? Um, so uh, the question that she was asking um, is, you know, soul winning, how many people come to Jesus as a result? Well, with radio, it's kind of hard to, uh, as, you know, Claire and some of these other people might understand, it's kind of hard to, to know that. But uh, anyway, when we started, started out very simply, and I just wanted to share just a couple of uh, little things with you, how we've progressed along a bit. Uh, when I started with radio, just started with a simple mic and a little tape recorder. Then we, then we advanced into a cardboard box. And the reason we did that is the mic that we started using was so sensitive, we were getting echo in the room and all of that, and the radio people said, 3ABN said, uh, you've got to get rid of that. So we set a, I set a mic up in a cardboard box, and I used that for about 15 years. And so I had um, the, uh, the box there and my controls on the, out, on the outside. <clears throat> so this last year, I spent uh, quite a few months building a 9 by 13 room down in my basement and so we've kind of moved out of the box and into an area here where we can do a little it's upgrade it's very homemade uh, but it mic, works mic up, it's very homemade but it works and uh, so here instead of the cardboard box have everything uh, set on a on a nice workstation at the other end of this room is a um, a backdrop that I built for video work to make it a little farmy, you know. Otherwise, we have to go outside, go to some farm, take equipment out there, do all of this. And if I can have something at home that I can use, then that's, uh, then that's what I wanted to do. So we're just in the process of trying to make that work. And uh, that's what a little bit what that might look like. So... <clears throat> I had uh, a lady come up to me this last uh, week at church, and she said, I was driving in the middle of Arizona, and, uh, and she said, I'm flipping through the radio, and all of a sudden, like, a station came on, and she said, and your spot was on. As soon as it was over, she said, I lost, I lost the airwaves. And uh, so who knows where these things are going to show up at, okay? Uh, we uh, received $2,500 from ASI last year. And so we're uh, uh, working with Mark Cromwell to upgrade some things for our booth. Uh, we took $2,000 and we said we're going to find a radio sta a church somewhere that will help us sponsor a radio uh, broadcast once a day, five days a week for a year. And so I had a friend of mine lives in Laramie, and he told us about the radio station. They had some evangelism money there. And so we're on the Laramie public station once a day, five days a week. And we love those public stations because you get the whole gamut of people, you know, that are out there. We like the Christian ones too, but we really like those public stations because that's where you get the whole general public. And uh, one minute, they're probably not going to turn that off. You know. So what are you planning for the future? What kind of vision do you have to um, continue with your ministry? Okay, we... Um, 
we're going to uh, do a little bit of, um, you know, I'll be going up to the church there in Laramie to visit that church and, and uh, have the church service up there. Uh, we've been to some of the churches in the Mid-America Union. Uh, we'd like to get to <clears throat> two or three fairs and into some parades this summer uh, with, our, with our booth and uh, with some giveaway materials and, and some banners on the side of a trailer that give the name of our, uh, you know, Seed Time and Harvest on the website and so on. And uh, so that's some of the plans that we have. There's some pretty major agricultural parades here, and our mission statement, by the way, is to invite people in agriculture to follow Jesus. Amen. So that's the group that we're targeting. But uh, Cheyenne Frontier Days, the Greeley Parade, some of these are some of some bigger parades in the area, and we're going to see if we can get into some of those. Well, we want to thank you for coming and telling Thanks. us about your ministry. We'd also like to encourage all of you to pray for Sea Time and Harvest, that these radio waves would reach exactly the person that God wants them to reach. Okay, so I have a one, a yes. one minute clip Go here. ahead, please. Okay, so this, this is a video of uh, kind of a sample of what a one minute video clip would look like. It should have audio. Okay, can we stop and do it over? Yeah. Okay. Go for it. Corn is susceptible to different kinds of pests, either insects or diseases. And one of the things that the corn bore insect will do is bore into the stock of the corn down low when the corn is real young and weaken the stock, or it'll bore into the shank of the corn where the corn is hanging here and it will bore in there so that if winds come along the ears will fall off or the corn won't survive because it's been eaten by these insects. The seed corn companies have genetically modified these plants so that they resist from the inside out these corn borers so that they are not a threat to the harvest. You and I as well need to be modified from the inside out and that's what God promises to do is to take by His power our hearts and change them, remake them, and remold them to stand up against the attacks from the enemy. I'm Rod Beaver with Seed Time and Harvest. So just one little point here is, is uh, uh, I was in a place and a lady came through my booth and I showed her this particular spot and she said, but I don't like GMOs. <laughs> So our point is not, we're not out to get farmers to do, to change their ways. We're out to help them to follow Jesus. Amen. And a farmer can relate to that. Amen. Okay. Thank you very much. Our next member in Action Spot is We Have This Hope Ministry. Is there anyone here from? All right. I didn't have your name for your ministry, so... Why don't you take that mic? Well, I wasn't planning on being up here tonight, but uh, we did get $5,000 last year from Mid-America uh, ASI, and that was spent up in uh, the War Road uh, uh, radio station, and we moved it from War Road to Wanaska. We went from 150 in which, watts. In what state is that? This is in Minnesota, northern Minnesota. And we went from 150 watts to 79,000 watts wow. with that radio station. Amen. And now we cover the whole northwestern corner of Minnesota. So uh, almost the whole northern half of Minnesota is covered with radio at this point because we have five stations all together. And what kind of programming do you do on your we station? We use um, Life Talk Radio. And people that aren't familiar with Life Talk Radio, what That's do they have? That's out of the North American Division of the General Conference. And... Uh, do they have speakers and music? They have, and they have It Is Written, they have okay. Voice of Prophecy, they have um, um, uh, Doug Batchelor's uh, Amazing Facts. And in fact, we throw some extras of Doug Batchelor's on because we really like his... Uh, <laughs> his uh, one he has on in the evening all the time. So we play it. Uh, they used to have a, a different one on, a, um, a psychologist that was on at noon, and some of his stuff we just didn't like because it wasn't solidly Seventh-day Adventist. So we took that off, 
and we replaced it with questions and answers from Doug Batchelor. And so he's got a solid hour at noon every day. So do you have any type of a testimony of someone that may have come to Christ because of your radio station? We have a, a uh, well, he seems like a young fellow. I guess he's probably in his 40s, but when you get to be my age, most people are a little younger than you are. Uh, but uh, he uh, was listening to the radio out when he was working in his garden. And he heard one of our local pastors who was in Brainerd at that time, Jeff Scoggins, come on, and he had a, a, a program every evening. And... Uh, What's the name of it, Jana? Can you help me with that? Um, spirit? Spirit and, spirit and Truth? Sp spirit and Life? Something like that. Anyway, he just really identified with Jeff Scoggins. And uh, he uh, set his alarm so that every night he would listen to that. And... Uh, then when Sean Boonstra had a series down in, in the, uh, in the uh, convention center in Minneapolis about two years ago, mm -hmm. um, we downloaded it into Park Rapids. They also downloaded it in, into Bemidji, and he and his wife attended that, and after that, that brought them in, and they were baptized. Yeah. This fellow was very active in, a, in, a, in his Sunday church, and so when he became a Seventh-day Adventist, he met with his whole church group and his pastor, and he suggested that, you know, they really ought to consider start keeping the Sabbath because it was biblical. Well, he didn't Amen. get any takers. Amen. Uh, but, he, he planted uh, a seed, though. He planted a seed, and he is a very good speaker. We've had him down, and he's given us several sermons in our church in Park Rapids, Amen. as well as being in Bemidji. And uh, he's just a shining example of what can happen by just happening to listen to the radio station. So I have a question for you, or I'd like you to speak to the people here tonight. Why should they support ASI Ministries? Because we're reaching people wherever they are. You know, radio reaches a lot of people in their cars. You know, unfortunately, when you're at home, you probably have that crazy TV on and you don't listen to it so much. But uh, in your car, you have a, a captive audience. Or if, like in this fellow's case, he took his radio out to the garden while he was working in the garden, he was listening to the radio. And lo and behold, he met the Lord out there. So God can work in amazing ways, can't he? He surely can. Well, again, I would ask you to pray for this ministry. We have this hope. Keep ASI Ministries in your prayer. Thank you so and we, much. We have radio stations now in Wanaska, Bemidji, Black Duck, Hibbing, and Park Rapids. Well, I, I give you credit just to be able to pronounce some of those names. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're I welcome. appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Our next members in action spot is going to be the Stone Valley Ministries, Roger Stone. Come on up, Roger. Now, Roger, you told me you had a really interesting story. First, tell us a little bit about your ministry, and then he's going to tell us a story about a monkey. <laughs> Well, the Lord's really been blessing us. Right now, we've got televisions going, television programs going out in three languages. We're reaching all of India, India Bangladesh, right. Nepal, and Pakistan. Plus, the TV station owners that are taking our program, they have all become Sabbath keepers. There's Amen. eight of them that own this TV program, station. And so they're sponsoring it on uh, YouTube. So our messages are going around the world in Telugu, English, and Hindi. Hindi is the most spoken language in India, second most spoken language in the world. And uh, hmm. so we're literally, it's actually going around the world. And we're having every week my TV speaker, Pastor Lee Sherrall, he's got 40 to 60 normally every week pastors, non-Adventist non pastors, asking for classes. And so he's going there, and about 25% of these guys are accepting everything right then. 
and they're changing their churches over to keeping Sabbath. But they keep their same name. If they're a Baptist church, they're still a Baptist church, but they're a, a Sabbath-keeping Baptist church. And they believe the state of the dead like you and I, and they believe in the spirit of prophecy. Hey. If they're Pentecostal or, or Lutheran, they do the same thing. I did want to ask you about the funding from last year. Can you tell us a little bit about how that money was used? Uh, I didn't get any money last year oh, from, from okay. ASI. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I thought all three of my missions members and actions had gotten that, so okay. No, but... Uh, but you have in the past, right? Have no, you? I never have. Okay. I never have gotten any. Okay. Uh, I do have a financier. I make it a point, I don't ever ask people for money. I only ask the Lord for money. Amen. And he's been giving me lately. I've been spending $10,000 a month because I've got the television programs. I've got three orphanages. I've got uh, a little over 30 pastors and 24 Bible women and 11 young men in training. And just lately now, uh, we've got t uh, churches up in the jungle. We've got about close to 100 churches right now that we've been able to start since 1999. Well, the Lord is never short of money, right? No, he isn't, but sometimes I have to get down on my knees and spend quite a bit of time. Yes. <laughs> but he always comes through. He's always come through. Amen. Uh, we've gone into many, many, many villages where everybody is illiterate. And uh, those villages are interesting to hold a series of evangelistic meetings in because you've got to get everything down simple. I mean simple. And you can't go too fast. I'm not in a hurry when I hold these evangelistic meetings. I don't care if it takes two months to to hold evangelistic meetings in the village, when the people are baptized, you change somebody from a Hindu to an Adventist, they're going to be, they're going to stay with it. And you can't go in in two weeks or three weeks and, and baptize people and have them stay with it. You'll baptize some people, but they're going to, most of them aren't going to show up again at the church. And you, uh, when, you, when you really get them solid, they'll stay there. And uh, we're really thankful for that. Uh, so, one village is named Pudipaka. I'll tell this story real yes, quickly. Yes, please do. Okay, we had Pastor Timothy up there. This is an area controlled by communist terrorists. And they really are communist terrorists. One day I had nine of them standing around pointing their rifles at me. So I know they've got guns. Anyway, um, a little village called Pudipaka, which means pig village. Pastor Timothy decided he was going to get, see if he could get Christianity into that village. And so he and his wife went there. And she'd go on one side of the village, he'd go on the other. They had a little tiny road down through the middle there. They call it a road. Uh, and uh, they'd go to every house and say, can I come in and pray for you? No, we're Hindus. But they didn't give up. That's one good thing about the Indians. They don't know what the word no means, but they don't give up either. <laughs> and they just kept, finally after three months, one lady said, well, my family's had a lot of sickness lady. lately. If you'd like to come in and pray to your God, she knew by reputation that he was a Christian. But there was no Christians in this village at that time. She says, you want to come in and pray to your God, it'd be okay. So he and his wife got to going back to that house three times a week for three more months. And then the lady next door came over and she said, you know, since you've been praying for these people, they haven't had any sickness. Would you come over to my house and pray for my family? We've had a lot of sickness lately. Amen. So then they had two. And then a lady on the other side of the village after three more months. And uh, he didn't give up. Well, then he started holding a little prayer meeting for three families three times a week in that village. And uh, so then he invited me, he ca called me one day and says, I've got six people ready for baptism. We went up to examine them, they were ready, we baptized them. And the church just kept growing like this. Usually it was six people baptized each time. And we got up, you know, somewhere over 20, maybe 24 people. And these guys are all farmers, they all have a little tiny uh, plot of ground, half an acre, an acre, and they, they raise vegetables, take it into the cities and sell them, that's how they make their money. And uh, they heard one Friday afternoon that the monkeys were coming. Now, uh, when they talk about monkeys there, we're not talking about little cute monkeys like you and I. These monkeys in that area, I go through there fairly often, I'm oh, in India, and these guys are four my. feet tall. Wow. And they're not afraid of you. If you got something they want, they're gonna take it away from you, unless you have a big club. So when they come to a farming area, uh, they'll go in and eat what they want, but they'll destroy the rest of it. And so, uh, they make clubs, of a big, you know, cut off limbs of trees and make big clubs. Make a handhold in there and they got a handhold, a club in each hand. And they had to leave somebody in their house or the monkeys get in the house, they'll tear those little houses up. Anyway, uh, they heard Friday afternoon, the monkeys are gonna be here tomorrow morning. And the Hindus said, okay, you Adventists, you better not be going to church tomorrow, you better be out here fighting monkeys. And the Adventists had Friday night meeting, they always do. They're very faithful, Wednesday night and Friday night. But remember, these people are all illiterate. The only thing they know is what we've taught them. And they were talking about, now what does God want us to do? You know, if the monkeys destroy our gardens, we don't have any more money for 
you know, six months or so. What does God want us to do? And they prayed and they talked and they prayed and they talked. Finally, they decided that God would want them to keep the Sabbath and trust him to take care of their farms. Amen. But they weren't sure they were right. They told me, they said, we weren't sure we were right then. But the next morning, the, the Hindus were making sure they got their clubs and they discovered dis, discover the admins are not going. They said, okay, you, you admins, next winter, when you're cold and hungry, don't tell us because we're not going to do anything for you. And they went out to fight monkeys and the admins went to church and they took their food with them and they spent the whole day together. And I'm going over this kind of fast because my time is limited. Anyway, uh, <laughs> late in the afternoon, one of the big boys in the church, he couldn't take the suspense anymore. He had to run down there and see what's happening. Just a little while before sundown. He went down there and he came running back. He says, the Hindus are still out there fighting the monkeys, but not one Adventist farm has been touched. Praise God. All of our, all of our farms, they call them a farm, a half acre. Anyway, it is a farm, I guess. Uh, not have been touched. So the... When he said that, boy, everybody jumped up. It was just about sundown. At sundown, the monkeys go back out to the jungle and climb the trees because there's tigers around there. And um, so the Adventists went down there and they saw the Hindus coming back. Man, their hair was hanging down. Their clothes were torn. They were bitten and scratched. They had saved their gardens with damage. But they ran down there and looked at their gardens. No damage. Oh, they came back to church and they had another meeting, a praise meeting. And the next morning, Sunday morning, so many Hindus came to them and said, we can't understand how you have so much faith in a God you can't see. They said, we can see our gods. They have these little uh, things where they can worship gods, you know, like they do in Catholic countries. They have things, the same thing in, in India. And, of course, they've got a lot of temples around. They said, we can see our gods. And we pray to them, but they don't protect our, our crops. But you guys had complete faith in a God you couldn't see. Immediately, the next Sabbath, there were more people in church. And our church is growing. Yeah. And uh, we've got a nice church there. Somebody from Minnesota donated the money. We built a nice church there. And I used to build it for $2,500, build a church that would heat and seat 125 people. Now that same church is costing about 5000 But uh, still, that's pretty cheap, $5,000 for a church that will seat 125 people. Well, we want to thank you so much for coming up and telling us that story. God can work through animals. He can work through people. He can work... <laughs> Um, in amazing ways, and we want to continue to pray for your ministry, too. Thank you. Stone well, Valley Ministries. Stone Valley Ministries. I work with Eden Valley. Great. I, I was Eden Valley when Amazing Facts gave me the first call to come to India, and I've been working through and with Eden Valley ever since then. Amen. Thank you very much. Those are sure some very inspiring stories. Thank you for having them share. And I was just thinking how good you are at that. You uh, ask the right questions and help things move in the right direction. And as someone who sometimes forget what it is I want to say when I'm up front, I appreciate that. <laughs> but you know, we know that when the Son of God walked the earth, he did more healing than preaching. Even though his primary mission was to preach the good news of salvation and redeem fallen mankind. And the reason that this apparent dichotomy is not really a dichotomy at all is because salvation, or Sousa, means to save, to make whole, to redeem man from sin, including its deadly effects. And so the cause of sickness and death is sin. This was clearly spelled out to Adam and Eve before they sinned. And so what kind of an antidote for sin would the gospel be if it did not address the primary results of sin? You know, Jesus himself pointed this out in Luke 5.24. If you have your Bible and you want to look at it, Luke 5.24. When he healed the paralytic, you remember the story, the paralytic that was let down through the roof by his friends. In 5.24, Luke 5.24 reads, But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. And I want to pause right there. What, what did he just describe what did Jesus just describe that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sin is that not the gospel this is the gospel and he says that you may know this is true 
that's my paraphrase, going on with the verse, he says, he said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise, take up thy couch, and go into thine house. So Jesus explicitly connected healing, physical healing, with the gospel. A primary purpose of physical healing is to authenticate the gospel according to Christ, according to the, the scriptures. In other words, health and healing are an integral part of Jesus' gospel of salvation from sin. And so it's no surprise that the Apostle John says in 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. You know, John had watched Jesus so long as he went about doing good, healing all manner of sickness, even raising the dead to life, that he understood the intimate and inseparable connection between physical restoration and spiritual restoration. I want to say to you as a physician evangelist, a lay evangelist, that healing can never be separated from the gospel. And the gospel can never be separated from healing. Both doctors and preachers err whenever we allow these two to be separated. And in our world today, there's a great, hmm, what shall I say, tendency to separate them. Many of you who are physicians in this room or trained in medical will, will be able to affirm what I say, that our training often attempted to separate the physical healing from the spiritual component. There is fortunately, uh, there's a greater acceptance of that now than there has been in the past. So we read in the Cress Collection, this is uh, to Dr. Cress from Ellen White. She says on page 45, paragraph 4, Sickness and disease is the sure consequence of disobedience to nature's laws and neglect of the laws of life and health. Inspiration tells us that if mankind had forever obeyed God and remained in harmony with his will, his law, that there would be no sickness. There would be no sickness and no death. Stop for a moment and let that sink in. Do you realize that, that America spends about 20% of our gross domestic product on sickness and death? That would be a, 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 like a 20% raise for the country. It's a major business in the America and in the world is dealing with sickness and death. But we're told that if we would have obeyed God, not deviated from his plan, this would have never happened. In other words, what this is telling us is that health and healing are the natural consequence of learning and following God's will, his laws. When we speak of something as a natural consequence, what are we saying? What we're saying is that it's built in. It's part of the benevolent design of our Creator. It's part of, part of what God intended for us without cost, without purchase. It's not something we need to buy or purchase. In fact, if we, we couldn't buy it if we wanted to. But it is part of what God gives to us freely as His children. And I want to illustrate with a story. My wife and I recently had the privilege of conducting a 10-day immersion lifestyle program in Lithuania at the invitation of members of parliament and with the active support of the main secular university in Lithuania. And most of the health guests, there were only about 10, were skeptical that anything meaningful could happen in 10 days. Actually, the blood tests were only seven days we took blood on Monday and again on Monday. And when they came on the first day and they learned that the meals were Genesis 129 based, in other words, there was only plant foods, a few of them thought this is ridiculous and uh, they were 
they were ready to leave. And since I don't speak Lithuanian, I really couldn't do a lot, but I did have some good friends, and they convinced them to stick around and see how it goes. And, and uh, seven days later, they were so excited and happy they had not left. Uh, so what we did, we served is, and I won't go into this in depth because you folks know this, but we served therapeutic meals based on Genesis 129, the design. And what's so interesting is from the wealth of, of lifestyle medicine science coming, we now understand that those foods turn the gene switches, they change the switches on the genes. It happens in minutes actually, but it does also happen, uh, more happens in days. But uh, that's another a whole, I'll, we'll talk about that another time. And what happened was that uh, they discovered how powerful it is to change the switches on your genes. You do realize, right, that you have all the genes for a liver in your ear. Thank, thank God they're turned off, right? I mean, so, so we are, science is learning how to turn one cell into another cell. I won't uh, go into this in depth tonight, but I want to tell you more about it another time. But we, uh, science has already turned a skin cell into a functioning heart cell in mice by changing gene switches in the cell. And, I, and, that's, and the point is how powerful it is. So anyway, the result was that uh, now there is um, um, the, act, the parliament itself, I would solicit your prayers, the parliament in Lithuania is planning to have a, a program, a lifestyle program, and want us to come back and do it just for members of parliament. You know, when we did that in the Marshall Islands with, uh, years ago when I was working with Canvasback, it was the tipping point. The, the nation of the Marshall Islands adopted lifestyle as the way to treat diabetes in the Marshall Islands after we had a lifestyle program for the Nitagella. So my bottom line for the health nugget tonight to you is that health is the natural consequence of learning, seeking learning and obeying God's will. You know, another place, um, well, I don't have to, the time to go into the depth, but you, if you're a student of the Spirit Prophecy, you will know that we're told that in this final age, God cannot do lots of miraculous healing because of the spurious healing that's going to be a counterfeit. And so he's chosen we're told that he has chosen to work miracles in connection with obedience to his law, his natural law. I claim that I ask God boldly, in faith, when we teach people to follow his laws for him to bring about a miracle of healing, and he does. And um, so we, for, I'll just, one, we had uh, one most unusual case there was, we had a gentleman who was, um, uh, in that program, and in seven days his cholesterol dropped over 100 points from changing, and so it got the people's attention. And uh, I want you to know that although our program tonight is a spiritual program, it includes health as part of the gospel. Thank you. God bless you. just drifts away and as I look back on the years memories of happiness and bitter tears through it all there was a common thread that cannot be ignored you were there teaching me to be your servant Lord all
Every joy and pain has a reason of its own. Now I realize that I was not alone. The changing seasons of my life were not left up to chance. Lord, I know you were working to fulfill your plan. All along, your hand has been guiding me, shaping my life to be a beautiful song. All along, you've led me through the things that you knew would make me strong. Your love has been there all along. Tomorrow when I turn around and I look back at today, I will understand your purpose and my thankful heart will say, all along your head has been guiding me, shaping my life to be a beautiful Don't you just love worshipful music? Just does something inside of you. It's so beautiful. Thank you, beautiful ladies, for singing for us and to the Lord tonight. Um, I'd like to ask Pastor Peter Neary to come up. Um, pastor Peter Neary is the senior pastor at the Paradise Church in Las Vegas, Nevada. And I had the privilege of just meeting him today. There are people here that um, have been to his church and are well acquainted with him, and I believe tonight we'll get a little bit more acquainted with you, right? I think so. All right. Well, thank you for coming and speaking for us at ASI. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I'll tell you, I, I, I don't know how to say this to you, but I'll try. When I hear some of the stories of the ministries that ASI is involved in, I sometimes ask myself if I really am a minister. Now, I know I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, but a lot of it doesn't add or measure up to what you folks are involved in. It really touches my heart. And so it's an honor to be here with you. You know. I was born and raised in Geneva, Illinois, outside of Chicago as a Roman Catholic. I moved to northern Wisconsin where I became a Seventh-day Adventist, attended evangelistic meetings at 26. And I cannot tell you what God has done for me. Well, first of all, he saved my life, plain and simple. I do not have the slightest idea where I'd be right now if it wasn't for God. And I even shudder to think about it. And so my heart has been deeply touched by the message of this church. And I think we all here know that we are very close to the end. And I don't care if my grandfather and great-grandfather and all the rest of them said that with deep conviction I believe it's really true this time and so I'm anxious to share with you 
the insights that God has given to me when he brought me from where I was to where I am now. And so I'm really honored to be here with you today. And when you Minnesotans come up here, I was at Minnetonka. I really, and, and my favorite place to go is the Boundary Water Canoe Area. Yeah. So anyway, I feel really akin to all of you. So do you mind bowing your heads with me as we pray? And I want to share something very special. Oh, Father in heaven, you are a great God. When I hear these stories, you work miracles in places that lack resources, showing your might, and we live in prosperity. And we want you to show your might tonight to us some more. I want you to help us to see that we really do need to be about our Father's business and why we should be. And so, Lord, here's what I ask you. Please use me in spite of me. And take these incredible deep thoughts organize them and bring them simply to us so that when we're done, we will see why the alarm is going off and we do need to be about your business. So send the Spirit now and speak through me, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Notice what the book of Daniel tells us, or actually about the book of Daniel and prophets and kings. As we near the close of the world history, the prophecies recorded by Daniel demand our special attention as they relate to the very time in which we are living. With them should be linked the teachings of what? The book of Revelation. And we're going to clearly see that tonight. Oh, hope I know how to work this. I don't. Is it going? Oh, I, have get it, I got it upside down. There we go. So the title of my sermon tonight is The Coming of the King of the North or What is Present Truth? And I invite you to take your Bibles with you and open them to Daniel the 11th chapter. We're going to read first from the Bible and then we're going to look more closely and you will see what God has given to this church, what our mission and message is that the world needs to know and is dying because they don't know. Daniel, the 11th chapter, will start with verse 40. I want to make sure all of you have your Bibles. The sword of the Spirit. Here's what it says. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen and many ships and he shall enter the countries overwhelm them and pass through them now now I want to stop there I, I forgot to say something to you I forgot to mention I want you to really think about these words as we look at them and read them thank you because there's an aura, aura about the book of uh, Daniel chapter 11. And I don't want that to cloud our mind to the, the beautiful truths God is going to reveal tonight from there that you probably hopefully already know. So as we read it, focus on this carefully. Verse 41, he, the king of the north, also entered the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape from his hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. 
He shall stretch out his hands against countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall have power over the treasures of gold, silver, and over the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. But news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. And he shall plant his tents of his palace between the sea and the glorious holy mountains. Yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. At that time, Michael shall stand up, stand up the great prince who stands watch over the sons of his people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. But at that time, at that time, our people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. I want you to look now back at verse 1. We have to start there in order to find the context. Let me repeat it again so we don't miss the point. Verse 40 says, at the time of the what? At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and many ships, and shall enter countries, overwhelm them, and pass through them. First of all, we need to look at the context. It is the time of the end. Now, in order to make this brief, we know the time of the end is 1798. That's when Berthier came from the south, Egypt, went into Rome and captured the Pope. And that brought an end of his domination, which we find in Daniel, the seventh chapter. We also find it in Revelation 13, etc. So we know the time of the end is 1798. Secondly, who is the king of the south? The king of the south always have been, and I know some will divert from this, in, from what I'm saying, but I'm strong here. The king of the south is and always was Egypt. Why? Because Egypt stands for atheism and secularism. Notice what Exodus 5 says, verse 20, and Pharaoh said, when Moses said, let my people go, and Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I shall obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let you go. And so I remember not long ago, when I first joined this church, the big power that existed at that time was materialism, secularism, evolution, all the things, by the way, that came out of the French Revolution. But all of a sudden, another power raised its ugly head and is beginning to overpower the king of the south. And so in the time of the end, it says there was a power called the king of the south that came against the king of the north. But the king of the north stood up to him and overpowered him. And so, notice what's said in Great Controversy, page 6, 269. Of all nations presented in Bible history, Egypt most boldly denies the existence of the living God and resisted his commandments. No. No mon um, monarch ever ventured upon more open and high-handed rebellion against the authority of heaven and then did, than did the king of Egypt. This is atheism. Now, the reason the Bible says in the time of the end, 
We are no longer talking about literal Egypt. We go back to the Old Testament to see what Egypt was like, and now it's applied how? Spiritually. And so the power that be not long ago was secularism, atheism, and do you remember the year some of us went through called God is Dead? Do you remember that? And we were all shocked. But it's not like that so much anymore, even though there still is a strong um, uh, power out there that's anti-religious. And so in the time of the end, this will happen, but We want to look next at who is the king of the north. When we look at Jeremiah, for example, back in the days of the Old Testament, behold, I send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord, and King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, will I bring them against this land. The king of the north, literally in the Old Testament, was Babylon, and Babylon was responsible for coming against God's people, destroying the city, taking and, and the sanctuary, and taking the people captive. Now in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, Babylon stands for those powers that fight against the law of God and the people of God. And so it's spiritual Babylon or my old alma mater, the Roman Catholic Church. And so now we see in the time of the end, there were two powers that were overwhelming the world. They both came in battle against each other. And all of a sudden, the one that came out smelling like a rose was the king of the north. And so the Bible goes on to tell us in Revelation 13, in three places, and three is a significant number, it says, and I saw one of the heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And then in verse 12, it says, to worship the first beast whose what? Deadly wound was healed. Verse 14, who was wounded by the sword and lived. In the time of the end, there would be a power that came into existence and began to dominate that is described to us in Revelation 13 as having a deadly wound when the Pope was taken captive in 1798. And basically, even though another Pope was appointed, the Catholic Church was shut down until 1929 when Mussolini put him back in power and now what do we see? An ascendancy of the Roman Catholic Church that is just unexplainable. Are you aware of how many of the famous Protestant preachers that you all know from their popularity and their huge churches being on TV and everything? Thank you, doctor. I needed that so bad. He knew what I needed. I couldn't get it open. Thank you. <laughs> they have all, they have all gone over to Rome and they have kissed the Pope's ring. Protestants. And by the way, we're no longer a Protestant country. You know that? Yep. And I want you to know the great controversy tells us all of this. And we've got to reach the people. They need to know the truth. This weekend, we're going to have revealed, slowly, step by step, we'll build on these. The things that they think out there versus what the Bible really teaches is just mind-boggling in their separation. Three times in Revelation 13, it says that he had a deadly wound and it was healed, emphasizing to us by the importance of the number three. 
Seventh-day Adventists wake up and understand this stuff. In fact, I'm going to go a little farther for some of you who like to have fun. In Revelation 17, the same power which is referred to as Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, three times it, it, it says in that chapter, it was alive, it died, and it came back to life. So that's three times in 13, three times in 17. And you've seen how we need to put Daniel together with Revelation. And if you wonder where I got this, I'm telling you, the, desire, the great controversy explains this stuff. We've got to know it, folks, because those people don't out there. They are looking in a total opposite direction from us. And it's time that we be about our father's business. Well, next comes, what does the king of the north do? Take a look at verses 41 through 43. Again, if you don't mind, I like keep reading. He also entered the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape from his hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon, by the way, that little last phrase there is one to be praised. It means that even the heathens that we look down on will come through for God. That's what that means, by the way. Verse 42, he, the king of the north, shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over the precious things of Egypt, also the Libyans, the Ethiopians, shall follow at his heels. What this tells us is the king of the north, folks, has unlimited resources and is experiencing and will great success. And we will look again at the book of Revelation that even highlights this more fully. And so we have here in verse 43, and he will gain controls of the treasures of gold and silver and riches of Egypt. They were the richest country back then, the most powerful, before Babylon overthrew them as they overthrew the Israelites. And so we now look at this spiritually. And Daniel, in his understanding, is using the backdrop of the Old Testament literally to tell us the spiritual story of today. Well, take a look at this. This is what really scares me. Oh, I forgot. I want to read this. Revelation 13, 8 has unlimited resources and success. Three times, Revelation 13. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Oh, I skipped one. I made a mistake. Oh, boy. And verse 12, And cause the earth and those who dwell to worship the first beast. I, I, I skipped one by an accident. My friends, three times, chapter 13, it says... Everybody worships the beast. Where do you stand? The whole world. Well, I don't care if the whole world does it. By the grace of God, I'm not going to do it. Daniel 11:14. He shall enter the countries and overwhelm them and pass through them. 41. He will sweep through many countries. 42. Power over many countries, including Egypt. 43, submission of the Libyans and the Nubians. And so the king of the north is going to come back to power and is going to have unlimited resources. In fact, look at this, though. Here's my concern and why we need to do what we're doing. Who also does the king of the north affect? Let's go back to 41. It says in 41, he shall also enter the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown. 
Okay, I got two questions. Okay, what do you, um, who else does the king of the north affect? The glorious land, okay? Now, in the Old Testament, that would be Jerusalem and Israel. But Jerusalem and Israel rejected the Messiah. And in the end time, the church is God's Israel today. This is saying that he will also affect the church. What do you notice about the word countries in your Bible? Okay. It's in italics. Oh, I had to enter the glorious land. And it's in italics. What does that mean if it's in italics? It means that it's not in the original Hebrew text. So now how should that text read? The king of the north shall enter the church and many will be overthrown. Now, folks, if you think I'm saying we have Jesuit spies within our church and I've got this conspiracy idea, I'm not saying that, even though I'm sure we do. If you know anything about Jesuits, they are no dummies. They're following Satan's lead, just like we're following God's lead. What I'm seeing in our church today, my church, is that their philosophy is affecting us in too many places. And it says there that many will be overthrown. That's us. We've got to know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We've got to have a real dynamic personal relationship with him. We need to pray every day and read our Bibles and the spirit of prophecy. And we need to get out there and share it wherever we can because when you share it, it gets deeper in your mind, even if it doesn't in theirs. And folks, the king of the north comes against the glorious land, which is the church in the end time. That's, we are the, the Israel of today. And many will be overthrown. Look at these four translations. I just fit, picks four. The Bible in basic English translated, he will come into the beautiful land and tens of thousands will be overcome. See, notice, he, he saw that the word countries isn't in there. And also the translators of the Revised Standard Version, he shall come into the glorious land and tens of thousands shall fall. And then in Young's literal translation, he has come into the desirable land, and many do stumble. And then in my favorite is the Amplified Bible, although there is a little mistake here that's kind of big. He, the king of the north, shall enter into the glorious land, and they, in parentheses, put Palestine. That's not correct. That's the image that Daniel used under inspiration to tell us in the last days it's the church. Look what it says. We'll enter the glorious land and many shall be overthrown. And I believe Ben Franklin. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Why should I lose my Adventist members to Satan's deceptions? That's why the Adventist ministry today has to strengthen and begin to preach the real truths that we believe instead of being afraid of offending people. Amen. It's happening. And so I take all this serious, and it makes me very concerned. Here's the Hebrew word for overthrown or fall or whatever you saw in those translations. It means to totter and waver. See? And, and, and cultural pressures are huge. Look, our young people are being blown away. 
It means through weakness of the legs, especially the ankles, by implication, to falter, stumble, faint, or fall. You know what I think of? Do you remember what Elijah said to the Israelites on Mount Carmel? How long will you limp along on two opinions? He said to them. It actually means this. Because it weakens us when we give in. It weakens us when we compromise. And the world is telling us this stuff doesn't matter. Just love Jesus and each other. And how can you love Jesus if you don't know the truth? In fact, my Bible says, and the truth shall set you free. Not error. In Matthew 24, 4, Jesus said to his disciples, Take heed, no one deceive you. Now count these. This is Matthew 24. That's the very first thing he said when he talked about the last days. Okay? Now let's look at verse 11. Then many false prophets will arise and deceive many. What is that? Number two, verse 23. Then if anyone says to you, look here is the Christ or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, come on, the very elect. Three times in Matthew 24, Jesus warned us of deception. That's why I'm concerned. That's why I feel this has to be preached. Because Satan ain't messing around. And we got to stop messing around. God is ready and willing. In fact, take a look at this. Relationship here. Oh, Revelation 13 again. One, he performed great signs deceiving those who dwell on the earth. Two, Revelation 19, 20. Then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those that dwelled on the earth. Revelation 16, 13, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, for they are the spirits of demons doing what? Performing signs. Performing signs. Well, question number six. What shall trouble? What shall trouble? I love this. The king of the north. Folks, what shall trouble him? Take a look at 44. It says, But news from the east and the north shall trouble him, therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Something really gets under his skin. Hallelujah. What troubles him? Tidings out of the east and the north. What is the east and the north? What direction does Jesus come from? And what direction does judgment come from in the Bible? From the north. Do you know um, Psalms 48, verse 2? Great be the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness, beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. On the sides of the north, the city of the great king. This is tidings from heaven, folks. Some message appears suddenly that infuriates the king of the north. Because he can't deal with these people. 
And guess what that is, these tidings? You afraid to guess? The loud cry, folks, it's the three angels' messages. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what sets him off. Because he finally realized there's nothing I can do with these people. We've threatened them, we've coerced them, we've punished them, we jailed some, we killed some, and they still persist. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so it says that the king of the north, or, and so we have the three angels' message. Angel number one is the truth. Angel number two is the error. And angel number three is the result of the error. Number one, it's fear God, worship him, the creator, Sabbath, the judgment, and the everlasting gospel. The error is the wine of Babylon, false doctrine. And three is the result of error, the mark of of the beast oh Lord these people don't want to hear it and some of our own people don't want to preach it but the only way to save them is tell them the truth you know what I tell my church and myself every year read the desire of ages and then read great controversy because we need to be able to present the three angels' message with the love of Jesus. And so read those two books over and over again. And then we'll be able to, with a smile and a joy, peacefully tell them what we believe the Bible says without getting fights, arguments, and screaming. Because they don't want to hear it. They have no clue like I had no clue. And then comes Revelation 18, verse 2, and he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, has become the dwelling place of demons and the prison for every foul spirit and, and, the, um, and a cage for every unclean and hateful bird for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her, Babylon's fornication. Now that's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That is to lighten all the world. That finally makes the king of the north decide this. Verse 45. It says in 45, And he shall plant the tents of his palace between the sea and the glorious holy mountain. Now the sea is the Mediterranean. The glorious mountain is Zion. It means spiritually the king of the north says, we're going to have to kill these people. We're going to come right up to them. They're, we got to kill them. It's the death decree, folks. Did you know this was all in Daniel? It's the death decree. He, they, he says we're going to kill these people. The death decree is passed. Remember this. Revelation 13, 15. And caused many who would not worship the image of the beast to be, what? Killed. He caused, verse 16, he caused all to receive the mark in the right hand or in their forehead, and no one could buy or sell. Because of a message that is, be given, that is being given by some people who refuse to deny their Lord and Savior in the spite of threats, pushes the king of the north and his consortium, consortium, whatever, Thank you. To pass a death decree. And when he does that, now we get to chapter 12, folks. At that time, Michael stands up. That's it. I've had it. No more. And we know that Michael is Jesus. He stands up. He's no longer ministering in the sanctuary. And he stands up and delivers his people in the gravest time 
that, there, there, that ever came on earth because they're coming to implement the death decree. When the death decree is passed, Michael stands up and probation closes. By the way, you know what that means? That even though we're running and hiding because of, uh, of the death decree, nobody's going to die because there's no sense in death once the probation closes. And so God has to somehow distract them from implementing the death decree before the time allotted. Oh, you all know about Esther. Remember? She had time to go into the king and say, you know, look what you, you signed here. And they had time to send out messengers through the entire kingdom to change the command. The death decree will be passed, but it'll be set for a date. And during that time, Michael stands up at the beginning, probation closes, and guess what happens? The seven last plagues are poured out. Daniel says, and at that time Michael shall stand up, and there will be a time of trouble such as never was. And by the way, I'm basically done. Because what happens next is Jesus comes back. And he gets his people. But he does it at a very unique moment during the seven last plagues. And that's coming next. So my folks, I wanted to show you that there's more here in Daniel than we thought. What the great controversy teaches is right there in Daniel. And we're living in the last days. Why? Because it says in the last days, people will run to and fro, and knowledge about prophecy in Daniel will increase. Well, check this out. I know this will date the illustration. In Time Magazine, it was called the Box Office Shepherd's article. In 2003, you all know that uh, Mel Gibson came out with his movie, The Passion of Christ, and how no one would back that movie in Hollywood, but it finally got um, produced. A year later came a man called Michael Moore, and Michael Moore did Fahrenheit 9-11. And no one would do that movie because it was political and highly charged. But both of these controversial movies about contradictory subjects came out and were incredibly successful. And look what Time Magazine said. At the very top, on the very bottom of the last paragraph, it says, Moore's working model. People think they know, but they don't. Moore's working model, Gibson's too. For all the things that separated them, and by the way, Moore came to Gibson and said, produce my movie, and, and he refused to do it. And others refused to do it because it was a movie opposing George Bush. And when, and when Gibson tried to get people to support his movie, people wouldn't do it. There were a lot of Jewish people in Hollywood. But they've both got it done. So it says, in spite of their differences, the things that separate them, both directors worked from the same script to convey the truth. Or at least the truth as they see it, to a world in urgent need of it. People think they know, but they don't know, time went on to say. And who could have imagined there would be so many millions of people ready to hear their pitch? Almost no one except those two. Folks, we got a better message.
and we need to get it out. Let me pray with you. Father, I want to thank you for how you put Daniel and Revelation together for us and heightened our understanding of why we need to be about our Father's business. And through all of this in my mind, I see the everlasting gospel that Jesus forgives sins, that he'll accept anyone, anytime, anywhere who sincerely comes to him. How can they do that, Paul said, unless they hear? And here are preachers in this room, Lord, who preach loud and clear through health, as well as works, as well as preaching. And that combination is unbeatable. Help us to be about your business and help our church to see clearly its duty, privilege, and honor to share your truth so that more can join your army. Give us a good night's sleep and bless all those who are traveling tomorrow. And Lord, please hold back the, the storm if it's going to keep people that should be here from coming here so that we can swell our numbers and worship you and honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.